Uh, okay, hi everybody. Uh, so, my name is Milos Kostanovic and uh, I was already presented, so I will just start with the talk. So, I work for uh, Zuper company. It is a startup fintech company based in Munich. And today I'm going to talk to you about an, uh, uh, applications of machine learning in fintech industry and in financial industry in general. So first, I want to introduce you and tell you a little bit about the history of banking and how it has changed and it will be changed in the future. Then I will transition a little bit about and talk about application of machine learning algorithms and tell you something about what I did in my, in my company. So the interesting fact about banking in general is that it is based on trust, right? So when the first banks opened, they had to look the part. They were robust, they made in marble, so that when you come to them, you have a sense that they will last for centuries in order to trust them with your money, right? So the first significant change came when uh, this machine was introduced called Irma. And this is the first time that technology significantly, in, okay, not signif significantly, but it impacted the banking industry in general. So the thing, the thing is that earlier when you wanted to open a bank account, you would just come, they will just write your name, you will sign it, and this was your card to deposit and pick up your money. As a consequence, if you go to another city, you had again to sign up your name and open another bank account, right? So this is the first time where actually account got their account numbers that we still use today. But do you know why? Because it was difficult for a machine to sort all this by name and surname because it is easier to sort like integers, especially in, in 50s. So this is the first time that actually uh, we got our account numbers that we still use today. So as a consequence, this is the first time that technology impacted banking and made them change the way they operate. Next significant change was that transition to self-service banking. So bank was not just a place. We got our ATM machines where we can go and do the service ourselves. The third significant change was once the mobile and internet developed enough, we wanted to have banking everywhere, anytime, right? And access them from our mobile phones and from our internet. Now, during 2008, during the financial crisis, banks were kind of occupied with financial crises, with the penalties and so on, and they kind of missed the big disruptions that were happening on the market. Remember, we have Uber, we have Airbnb, and then banks kind of missed to innovate or innovation was not in the forefront of their business model, right? So what changed? We as the users once needed only trust to give our money to the banks and the whole process was based on the, on the trust. But with the development of mobile phones, internet, we started to ask more. We started to ask for ubiquity which means that we wanted to do our banking from any place, at any time, and from our mobile phones. And second, we started to ask for utility. We wanted additional value to our banking experience. So let me ask you now, before continuing, how many of you actually enjoy your banking experience? Really? So you like going to the banks, waiting in lines, missing... Sorry, you have... You have mobile apps, yeah. But uh, tell me this, if you want to transition to another bank, what happens to your previous data in previous bank? Can you like move it to the other bank? Yeah, I don't know. That's why I don't <laughs> okay, uh, let me give you an example of my experience. So I invested a lot of time in categorizing my transactions because I wanted to see in which category I spent and how much. And I wanted to follow that trend from month to month, right? It makes sense. So then I started or tried to change the bank, but then all of my data and all of my time that I invested was left in my old bank, and I could not share this data and pick it up with me and take it with me, right? Let me give you a second example. So we are now in 2019. Uh, I want to ask you, what is the uh, average time that is acceptable for you for some service that you 
have, like Facebook or Google. So what is the downtime that is acceptable for you? No downtime, right? So I got, a, and probably uh, people from Serbia know this, I got an email from one bank like a week ago, and they said we'll have a downtime of five days. You cannot use your mobile phone, your mobile app, or your internet app for five days. So it seems like this is not exactly in accordance to times in we are living, right? So this is because banks are still very conservative and not that agile in adapting to new technology and new processes. So there is a gap. This gap started in 2008, and it is continuing until these days. And this gap says that we, as users, request ubiquity, and we also request utility. And this is where a lot of fintechs came into the picture. Now, the biggest change is actually happening in Europe. It's called open banking. And basically, it says the data in the bank, the transactions that you made, are yours. And you're only allowing a bank to keep them for you. The second big change is that this, uh, they requested from every bank to enable you to take your data and give it to the third person for whatever reason. So this is a really cool thing. Why? As a data scientist, you, got, you now get a whole new data set that you can experiment on. And create a new interesting features and also new interesting uh, features for the users, right? So very briefly, this kind of disrupted and made a revolution in the way we look at banking as the users and also as banks. There are several here legislations that are passed, like GDPR, you know what that is, PSD2 or Payment Service Directive, which basically states that every bank needs to open an API and allow you or third person to access your data with your approval, of course. Then there is a SIPA, Single Europe, uh, Euro Payment Area, which says that people in European Union can transfer money almost instantly without additional charges. And then there is also a CSCA, Strong Customer Authentication, which basically requests a two-factor authentication for users and also for their transactions. If you look at the global uh, stage, we can see that actually uh, European Union is in forefront in open banking, considering the other parts of the, of the world. In the United States, there is no legislation in the state that specifies that you need to open your APIs as a bank, but there are some kind of private uh, contracts and agreements between different, different uh, companies. In China, the, thing, uh, the situation is completely different. Since they have uh, Alipay, which is a subsidiary, I think, of Alibaba, it is it has become the largest mobile payment system in the world. Mobile payment system. And it has like one billion users. So basically, you do everything from your phone via some kind of wallet, right? There is another thing there. Uh, there is another app called WeChat. It's basically some messenger app. But the thing is that it has integrated also money sending options. So I can send to my friends money via this app. I can also call a taxi and everything else. So you see when I said ubiquity and utility, how the stage has changed a little bit. And that users now have kind of different companies that offer you traditional services of a bank. So to give you a little uh, context, what are the names and phrases that are used now in fintech uh, market? So new data source and increased amount of data, because until now the data was kind of locked inside one bank, but now you can actually have your data and also have your historical data and track and do interesting things with it. There is also another trend that this is like integration of your financial data with other data, like data on your Facebook profile, or data about your fitness health, or whatever. Uh, main services that are offered are deposits, savings, lending, and payments, at least from customer perspective, and I will get back to that later. Digitalization, transforming the data, this data in important information and insights. Uh, technology integration, which fintechs are really good at because they are based on cloud systems, 
and artificial intelligence. And on the other hand, traditional banks have a lot of legacy systems that they just cannot reconcile fast enough, and also they're not agile enough. Uh, there is also first mover advantage for the companies that started to be data-driven and think the other way about how to approach this banking problem. And there is also discussion about uh, difference between first principle design or disruption and iterative thinking. So basically what somebody said there that you now have mobile app and you do everything from there, this is not actually disruption, right? This is just integrating technology. Once you had your card in your hand, now you can do it from your phone, like you have card in your phone, right? Disruption would be Bitcoin because it like skips all the processing steps of standard transaction. But then there are other problems with Bitcoin and why it is not used that much in traditional banking. Uh, so ubiquity and context-aware human-machine interactions are really important. We can expect that this integration of financial services to integrate even more in our lives, e either in our watches or smart things. And we can also expect that at some point we don't use cards, but for identification we can use our biometric scans, right? Why do, do I need a plastic card if you can identify me in some other way? Uh, creating a new services is a, a normal result of everything that I just said. And there are also talks about job loss that is like a big topic in the financial sector because uh, for this new age, the traditional jobs in banks do not correspond well to what is in demand, actually. So how, do the market, how does the market actually look like? So you have three players or three groups of players. First are traditional banks that are traditionally conservative, not agile. Second ones are fintech, a small companies that try to insert or disrupt some part of the, of, the, of the market. And the third ones are big internet companies. So an example of big internet companies getting into the financial systems is, for example, China. But you have this also in USA and Europe too. For example, Amazon exper is experimenting a lot with student loans, Facebook has about 50 different patent, uh, patents on how to send money through the messaging app. So they are thinking about it, they're just not implementing it, maybe yet fully. What it comes down to is these four things, consumer trust, technology platform, consumer reach, and regulatory comp competence and industry know-how. So internet companies obviously have customer reach and they have technological platform, but they don't exactly have consumer trust about your financial data. Uh, from some research uh, that is done, a person is, would rather like uh, give financial data to one institution and social data to another than to have everything in one place and trust uh, completely to somebody. And it is still like a nor a, 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 an average person would trust more to bank than to, to some internet company. On the other hand, fintechs have a technological platform, but they have, uh, they have limited customer reach. And here you can see some of the neo banks and some of the startups that are trying to insert themselves in the field. So by the report of 100, top 100 fintech companies, you can see them, the breakdown by sectors here. The, la the largest number is in payment and transaction industries. Uh, one of the reasons is this open banking and access to open data or your transactional data now. Uh, now, let me slowly transition in implication and application of artificial intelligence in fintech industries. These use cases that you can see here are made from the point of banks or companies in general. So they're talking a lot about, about robot advisors, uh, chatbots that can like decrease the number of tickets for the support, fraud and laundry prevention, uh, hyper-personalization or know your customers, or in banking industry, it is also known as kill your customers with paperwork. Alternative credit scoring, where they're trying to... Do you know actually how the credit scoring usually works now in the banks, if you want to take a credit? They basically look just your income, your debt, and your default rate. Do you have any mortgages and did you default on something? But with all this new data, you can actually profile historically 
uh, your user and check if he is viable for, for your, for, for to issue him a loan. Uh, there is also integration with financial assistance and voice recognition and also a customer prediction and insight into your customers. Uh, this is basically a breakdown uh, by the segment of the market that artificial intelligence and machine learning is influence or impacting the most. But I want to concentrate on impact on the uh, end consumer, so I will just continue. Now, what does this mean for us, like end consumers? Uh, the way to think about your finance is similar, by my opinion, how you should think, how you think about your financial, sorry, your fitness health. So what is Google Fit for your fitness health? That should be some mobile app for, for your financial health. So you expect, you, you expect it to track you, you expect to offer suggestions, to educate you, to offer you comparison between you and your peers, and so on and so on. So not to be intrusive, but also to be helpful. In essence, you want to keep your money in a place where it will grow. You want to access credit when you need it, as fast as you can. You want help to plan your financial journey or to plan your financial health. And you also want service where, where you usually use it, and that is usually at the moment on your mobile phone. So what are the features that majority of fintechs are now talking about? Usually there, there is no fintech company that offers everything, but everybody is choosing like an area that they feel their business revenue can be made. So they offer you insights about your budgets. This is based on transaction categorization. So I can say, okay, you spend on kids approximately 300 euros per month. Then I can offer you an insights like this month you have spent less or this month you have overspent or you have some money left, you can maybe transfer it to your savings account. You have savings suggestions, you have probation of impulsive buys. If I can detect via machine learning that you, are, you have tendency to do it. Also, I can recognize if you have a contract for your mobile phone, for your gas, for your rent, and then remind you to pay it or to remind you that you did not pay it this month. Both loans and payment, it is really cool because you can track real time your credit score. How eligible are you to get a credit? Uh, you can have an instant lending where credit can be approved in a few minutes, or you can have an overdraft prediction that, for example, in the United States is like a really big deal because the penalties are really high. Uh, recurring transactions also lead us to creating autonomous payments for your gas bills that I just mentioned. You can have card fraud prevention. Uh, you also expect faster response time, integration with your virtual assistant, which is really a cool feature, especially for marginalized groups. For example, imagine if you are blind and you can control all your banking through your virtual assistant, Google or Siri or something else. And then there is also a part where you need to kind of educate your users about responsibilities and this new way of thinking about your financial health. If we are talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence in general, the general application from a user perspective is uh, to recognize a voice command that I just explained, also to have kind of motivation of users to spend less, or to compare them to their previous months or to their peers or social group. Uh, interesting fact here is actually that Facebook has, I think 10 days ago, filed for a patent that they can compare your financial state to your friends on Facebook. Right? I mean, it, it probably will fail. It is really hard to patent something like that. But you see where, a kind of where their thinking is going, right? Uh, predictive spending or predicting overdraft prediction, scheduling transactions, and credit scoring algorithm that I 
just mentioned. Another important topic there is also gamification, like setting goals so that you can be financially more healthy. But also, there is a lot of talk about behavioral science and like trying to profile your users. Now, this is a bit of a controversial topic. On one hand, you can try to target your user and say, okay, at this time of month and this part of day, this user is most likely to save money. And then at that time, you offer him, do you want to transfer like five, 50 euros to your savings account? But on the other hand, do you as a user really want this kind of intrusion and this type of profiling in your life? And there is a lot of a debate about how much of a behavioral science should be used there and how much you should be aware of it, right? And the legislation is pretty strict on that. Uh, regarding practical applications and what I actually did in my company as a data scientist, I did transactions categorization, overdraft prediction, contract recognition, and credit scoring. Each of the projects has different problems, uh, and I want to show you, for example, about credit scoring something. So there, there was a study that allowed users, when taking a credit, to write anything they want in a field, right? So. Then there was a question, which words have positive correlation with successful, success, successful loan repayment? And these were the words. Can you guess which ones have positive correlation? It's a little bit tricky, right? You have a free form field. So it, took, it, it turned out that like God and promise have negative correlation, but debt free, thank you and minimal payment have positive. So basically, if I say, uh, I promise I will return your loan, so help me God, you should probably not give me a loan. <laughs> but my point here is this, that you have a completely different approach on how you're assessing users about their credit worthiness. So we already have an example in China where they have like more than 10,000 data points from your social networks, your messages, and they use that to say if I should issue you a loan or not. I was in Visa data center in London two weeks ago, and they also have their own version of this kind of algorithm. But they are aware, they are careful to say that this is like only complementary service because they don't want to take a risk of what if your users default. The topic is really interesting because banks are traditionally strict about issuing loans. They base it on these four principles that I already explained about debt and income. So there is a group of people there that are more likely to be denied their loans and then fintechs want to try to uh, by producing these behavioral transactional algorithms to try to in insert themselves into this market. Uh, regarding technology, uh, for banking, or as, at least for this consumer part, you usually use supervised and unsupervised methods as, as well as reinforcement learning. Uh, you have an interesting natural language processing problems and name entity recognition, because if you think about it, your transaction is actually this purpose field that you get and your merchant field that you get. So it is interesting to try and deduce from that some kind of uh, entities. Uh, I can say that it's pretty easy for me to guess, for example, if you are married or if you have kids, based on name entity recognition, what your purpose of what you are buying. So for example, if you're in Germany, you will probably receive some government help. I can even guess how, how many kids you have. It goes to the point of like profiling your users. Uh, neural network and deep learning, we use at our company TensorFlow. We use microservice architecture because we want to be agile and also scalable. And deployment model is, all, for deployment, we also use Kubernetes and Docker. I think a panelist before me uh, really explained this uh, uh, a lot, uh, the name of the, of the, the topic was coding in data science. So what are the risks and challenges? Uh, there is the risk of sharing data because now this transfers to us as the users, right? So you sh kind of need to be careful who do you allow to, take your, to, to use your data. There is also a problem with adaption of regulations. 
Although Open Banking says that every bank should open the, their API, it did not actually specify how should these APIs look. So now you have a new set of startups that are basically like aggregators that connect to each of bank and then they offer you a service to uh, use them if you want to take your data and transfer it somewhere. This is an interesting topic because it says also that the future of fintech will be probably collaborative. What does that mean? Uh, if you're a bank and you're like really good in banking and loans and this traditional stuff, but you're really bad at machine learning and user interaction and user interfaces, you can actually allow a third party app to do your job instead of you for this user part. For example, I can be an app, personal finance management app that you will have, and then I can enable you to connect to any bank you want. And if you want credit, I can connect you to some other banks and offer you like the best rates and, and so on. So if you want, for example, cate category uh, uh, categorization of the transactions, you can use a third party that, just, uh, that does just that. Of course, there is a, a problem there about the revenue and business model, but the future of fintech will probably be collaborative in that sense. Uh, there is the problem about explainability of machine learning models. Credit scoring is also a great example because if you're as a user denied the loan, you would probably want an explanation. And you have to be able to explain to the user why did the machine learning algorithm deny you access to credit or to loan. Uh, education and coaching, I already covered this topic, so I will skip it for now. And there is also skills shortage. So this has like two, two dimensions. First, traditional fintech doesn't have that many data scientists and machine learning engineers or creative designers that will design a user experience, which is something that obviously today users need. Right? There is an approximation that uh, like, I think about 30% of jobs in banking will be lost in the next 10 years, or supplemented by software developers and data scientists. The other problem is actually in data science. At the point, and also one of the panelists mentioned this, data scientists today, or machine learning engineers, as you, as you call them as you want, like learn only limited look on the system. They usually learn about, they get the data set and they learn about the models. But there is a lot of work to be done before you get a data set. And there is also a lot of work to be done after you get the model. There is a famous joke where a machine learning, the, an executive comes to a machine learning engineer and says, but your model is not working in, in production. And machine learning, uh, machine learning engineer replies, yeah, but it works real well on, data, on, on my test data set. Right, so if you want to develop end-to-end -end solutions, you have to be aware of all this process end-to-end. -end. Uh, so, in the end, I want to conclude and go back to my introduction that fintech or banking was once built upon the trust, but now it's much more built up on utility and ubiquity as well. And uh, I'm not sure if you know that 70% of millennials would rather go to the dentists than go to the bank. Shout out to all the dentists. <laughs> so it is obvious that there is a gap between what we as users expect, especially like younger generations, and what our banks ready to offer. So. Uh, the times are great, there is a new data set, a data source available, and hopefully we are going to see uh, a lot of new cool features and take care of your financial health. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Vilos. Well, we have two, three questions actually that are coming in, which, I mean, I like this one. This is, this is something for artificial intelligence, I believe. In which financial city center in Europe are you seeing the best opportunities for software engineers, data scientists working in fintech, and can you provide information of salaries and vacancies? <laughs> okay, uh, London and Berlin are probably the, the place to be if you want to be in fintech. London was like the really epicenter, but now with Brexit, Berlin is becoming more and more popular and maybe Munich. But I would say London and Berlin for sure. 
Regarding salaries, I cannot speak to that. Vacancies? I would say that if you are a data scientist, you will get a job, especially in fintech. Okay, the traditional banks seem to be going through major cost reductions, and I wonder if the new fintechs will add to the woes of the big banks during the next decade. It will add to the woes. I mean, the, it will put them in more, more and more trouble. Mm. When I speak about fintech industry and banking, everybody asks me who is going to win. I don't think that there, you sh we should think about it as who is the winner, who is the loser. It is a cake that was traditionally held by banks, and now we you have new, new players in the market. For example, if you have kid, your kid is probably more likely to open their banking account with Facebook or Instagram than it will be to open in some traditional bank, right? But then again, the market is big and it is large and it is a good thing that it is making traditional banks kind of reinvent themselves because they have to. Now, they're not going to close, but it is more probably that they're kind of, they'll just switch to some kind of different approach to, to banking. For example, a lot of traditional banks are actually supporting fintechs and funding, funding them from behind because they understand that this is like a new way to go they keep their old customers, if I can call them that, but then they also have fintechs to acquire these new generations that are more into ubiquity and utility and maybe a little bit less in, into trust. And the final question, what are the biggest challenges of predicting customers' future transactions? If you mean future transactions, I guess that you are talking about future spending, right? So this is the topic that I skipped. Uh, the big problem with predicting uh, future transaction or future spending or order prediction, these are like all similar terms, is if you're using an ATM. So if you as a user take cash and spend cash, I have no idea where you spent it. So this is why in Germany actually cash is still being used really much. But on the other hand, in Sweden, it is usually you have a lot of places where it's cash free, right? Only cards. But on the other hand, cash is a great anonymity tool. So if you want to be anonymous, you can use cash. So the problem would probably be uh, that if you want to get this kind of utility and services, you will need to open your data and you know, use your cards or your online payments. So you don't like ATMs? No, I would say that uh, everybody will find what is most, most comfortable from them, for them, yeah. Yeah, but from the, from the position of data scientist. Oh, I gave up on my privacy that sense a long time ago. I mean, if you want to have like services, then for example, I have a Google Home in my, in my home because I want to command it, you know, turn on and off lights with my voice. I know that they can, everybody can listen to me, right? So, but if you are, I don't want to use the word paranoid, but maybe if you're a private person, then you should probably not use technical devices so much. But then again, if you want additional service, then I guess you need to open your data. And legislation in Europe is kind of really strict about that at the moment. And maybe it is the rare thing where European Union is in front of other markets. Milos, thank you. Yeah, thank you so Here's much. Your certificate. Thank you.